Originally published in 1957, How the Grinch Stole Christmas is the story of an antisocial creature living atop a mountain peak who will do anything he can to stop the Who's down in Whoville from celebrating Christmas. Ted worked closely with Chuck in adapting the story to the screen. They were like good friends. They had fun together, they laughed. I remember Helen writing to someone right when the project was beginning. She said, Ted can trust him and we'll have fun with him. He had a lot of fun writing the songs for it. Chuck Jones and his team of animators brought the Grinch to life using ten times the amount of drawings required in a typical cartoon, making it one of the era's most expensive half hours of television. Chuck's inspired animation and the voice of Boris Karloff as the Grinch helped create a holiday classic. Generations of children remember the ending when, despite the Grinch, the Who's down in Whoville celebrate the real spirit of Christmas. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. He puzzled and puzzled till his puzzle of a saw. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. I think Ted was very pleased with it. He was proud of it, too. Ted never had the same pride in subsequent animated specials that were seldom rerun. Despite the Grinch's success, production budget shrank, making the genius of Chuck Jones unaffordable and Ted less engaged. Oh, the leapfrogs are a leapin' and they're leapin' mighty fine. And they're beepin' while they're leapin' in the good old sunny shine. It's gonna be a beepin' leapin' moo moo of a day. A fuzzy berry, Beasley berry, Lulu of a day. For Theodore Geisel, it always came back to the world in which he had undisputed control, his books. And for the past four decades, his 69-year-old wife, Helen, had made the world of Dr. Seuss possible. But their marriage had evolved more into a respectful partnership. They maintained separate bedrooms, and Helen, five years Ted Sr., was in weakening health. She was getting blind, but she was always a uh, cheerful right up until the time she began to realize someone was moving into, what should I call it, her marital territory? We were very good friends. I was something else again that he hadn't happened to come up against. And he fell in love. I have to feel it. The big picture, it was meant to happen. Audrey Stone Diamond and her husband Gray had been friends of the Geisels for six years. On October 23, 1967, while Ted lay sleeping in his bedroom, the Geisels' housekeeper discovered Helen dead in her bedroom from a drug overdose. Next to her body was a letter. Dear Ted, what has happened to us? Loud in my ears from every side, I hear failure, failure, failure. I love you so much. I am too old and enmeshed in everything you do and are that I cannot conceive of life without you. My going will leave quite a rumor, but you can say I was overworked and overwrought. Your reputation with your friends and fans will not be harmed. Sometimes, think of the fun we had through all the years. Helen. I don't think he realized the impact that the change in his life had on her. 
He said to me, oh my God, what do I do? Kill myself or burn the house down? And I came up and, and Ted was walking down the uh, path toward that gate. And we embraced. Uh, he, he was just kind of numb. I, I just could look at him and he didn't have to say anything. I sensed no discord between Helen and Ted. And neither did family or friends. Looking back, a few people saw her within 24 hours and 48 and said she looked very sad. But there was simply no hint, no clue. It was a terrible shock. The suicide of Helen Geisel, wife of America's most beloved children's author, triggered rampant gossip and finger-pointing, especially in 63-year-old Theodore Geisel's hometown of La Jolla. And it was a hard winter for him. It was, it's, I, I remember it as very dreary and foggy and rainy all the time, although I don't suppose it really was. It looked terrible. He was not happy those days, and he needed company at lunch, and I provided it before we went to work. In August of 1968, Ted married 47-year-old Audrey Stone Diamond. She would live with him in the house atop Mount Soledad. Below them, the community remained wary, some casting blame on Ted, on Audrey, or both. It's exciting to people. We'd be here and everything subsides. Everything always has, always will. And, of course, we were so right. Audrey loved a scene. She could handle any conversation and still can. He would just look at her so proudly. It was like taking a, you know, a dancing doll to a party. She'd whirl around. She'd absolutely charm people. And Ted could retreat happily to his corner and, and enjoy all this. He never cared what he was wearing before, but now he was wearing color-coordinated pants with very nice shirts, and his hair was more often combed, and he looked a lot spiffier after Audrey came on the scene. <laughs> Everything changed after their marriage, and he was growing older and wanted to do new things. Audrey was so energetic that it gave him a big boost. With Audrey's encouragement, Ted wrote the Lorax, a morality tale on pollution and greed, a serious departure from the usual Susian antics. The mysterious onceler cuts down truffle trees to make things called thneeds, which nobody needs. Despite the plaintive calls from a creature called the Lorax to stop, the forest is destroyed. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So, catch, calls the onceler. He lets something fall. It's a truffle seed. It's the last one of all. Plant a new truffle, treat it with care, give it clean water, and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest, protect it from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. The idea of doing a book for kids with a message that's this dramatic and almost dogmatic, propagandistic, if you will, really kind of um, disturbed some people. Sales of the Lorax were sluggish for a Dr. Seuss book. Ted felt that if you weren't patronizing and you weren't false, that you could discuss practically anything with children. Ted said uh, adults who just uh, obsolete children into hell with them you want to reach them before they become obsolete. <laughs> and uh, that's what he was intending to do with that book. You know, I'm surprised that there's not an environmental group called Lorax.com, you know, who go around trying to, you know, protect the world. Big thinker. Big, big thinker.